I think what I'm also really interested in is in that the first conversations you had with your first doctor, well, first of all, how did you get to your first oncologist who <laughs> I see your facial expression? <laughs> story there, right? So let's talk about what happened there, who that first doctor was, what that conversation was like. Okay, great. I'm so glad that we get an opportunity to go there because the first oncologist was appointed to me as one of the five doctors who came to my bedside while I was um, hospitalized initially to figure out what was going on with my, my lungs and why they were crashing and where is this fluid coming from. 1,700 uh, ml uh, units had to be drained from my right lung and they left half of the liquid in there reserved for the VAT surgery. Uh, and they got some more of it out that way. So I had the surgeon, I had the oncologist that was appointed nearby a local one that came in. I had the hospitalist and a couple of other, maybe cardio doctor that came in so that now we can rule out some things. But the lucky one that stayed was the oncologist. So, uh, and the hospitalist. So the oncologist there uh, was sharing with me because now we're, I'm asking her about prognosis. This is critical. You're at my bedside and you're sharing some things with me. At first, you was like, oh. and you know, you're talking that way. And in another breath, you're like, oh, you got about 15 months to live. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> That changes the whole gamut of things. Uh, and like, well, what can we do about this? And she said, well, I can start you on, um, they call it the salad mix, Carbo Altima. I'm not going to even try to pronounce all the medical names that go with that. But most uh, folks in the community of survivorship or cancer patients, you know that there is a, a mixture of a chemotherapy to try, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, intravenous chemotherapy uh, to try to stop and, you know, reverse the cancer um, in its place. And so I did that for about three cycles, three weeks with this local oncologist who knew absolutely nothing about the different biomarkers and how to treat these different mutations. I know that for a fact, because I was receiving some, the, the different treatment plants she had me on was killing my cells. I was dying quicker, seemed like. It was like, wow, this doesn't look like it works. And I, and I, I had to stand up for myself. And, and plus, it was like a treatment that she was giving that she, I'll just say it because it's my story. It was the same treatment that she would give a smoker. There, I said it. Same treatment, stand in line. Matter of fact, when I went there, there were people literally lighting up cigarettes, like waiting outside somewhere to get their, their um, treatment. And there were signs in the bathroom that said, no smoking allowed. And I'm like, wow. Oh, and then here it's like, okay, stand up, your turn, stand in line, roll up your arm. Oh, do you have a port? And then you can probably see my scar right here. Do you have a port? Okay, well, use your port, put this in, da, da, da. It was like, roll. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, stop, slow up, wait. Can you tell me, can you pinpoint to me where exactly is my cancer? Matter of fact, what I'm going to do for you, doc, I'm not going to say that doctor's name because I just don't have the best. I don't have, it in, have her in the best light. And I, but I brought her a coloring sheet mm -hmm. and it, I used one of her brochures in her clinic. And I took and I, I drew the lung shape. I said, can you tell me which one of my cancers is in your brochure or what does mine look like? And she really, really didn't have the best answer for me. And then I knew deep down, I said, I think I need to go somewhere else. And then I followed that hunch. I went to University of Michigan. And there is where I learned that there are different mutations and that I had options. And I did not need to do right away the intense, hard 
chemically altering cell chemotherapy treatment, intravenous treatment that they had me on it immediately. That came to a stop immediately. You're not feeling seen. You're not feeling heard. You're feeling like you're a cog in a machine, right? Like I'm just one in a line of things. Um, are you really treating me and what's going on in my body? So that was the driver for you taking that coloring sheet, right? And being like, hey, doc, tell me what's going on. I want to know what you know. And when I did that, here's the big insult. She said to me, Sharice, you have monkeys in your head and they're speaking to you. You need to just stop listening to them and accept your diagnosis okay <laughs> that was the real fast i thought i would have also had the same reaction <laughs> that's enough i'm out of here you're not the, clearly you're, you're done not, yeah <laughs> you're not um even as an advocate i feel like there are moments when you don't want to be a bad patient and you want to say well you know what the doctor knows everything they know what's best they did all the medical training so I should just listen. And it's hard. There's a voice, right? There's a voice there. So can you help give people guidance here? What can motivate them to say, no, I need to speak up for myself. I can and should speak up for myself. Here's the teacher type skill in me coming back out again. There's a concept called Kagan strategies. It allows people to come together and interact in a way that you can move and get a goal done, accomplish, complete it. You, you help folks get together and have a camaraderie of spirit so that the end goal would be the best practice for that patient, project, individual, whatever we're going for. So when it comes to me, Oh, no, I know how to collaborate and get all of these care team who is whoever is on my care team. That's the homework that I have to do. It's like, OK, this doctor specializes in this. This one is needed for side effects. This one is the neurosurgeon. I need to see how they all all why they are on this team. First of all, that's homework. Why are you on this team, Team Shirees, patient Shirees? What are you to do on this team? And when I know that, I and something is going on with me, I can say, oh, this may fall in these two categories. So let me get these two in a conversation. Whether I do it through my patient portal, or I write down questions so that I can take it to my appointment and compare notes. And then what I do is I know how to eat fish and pick out the bones. That means I try to, because still at the end of the day, the patient has to decide exactly which way you're going to go to what's being presented to you. Because if you are presented with options, I have to look at the data that I've been collecting in the antidotes. Okay, sorry if I'm using too many kind of teacher type behind the scene, you know, concepts, but that's what I use now in order to make data driven decisions. Yeah, data driven decisions. That's what I do now. I love that. And I, I think it's an important message for people. Um, you know, going back to, to this biomarker testing, I want, I want to really dive into this because it had not been brought up at all in your first conversation, right? It was skipped to this harsh chemo and that's that. You go to a second opinion, you get the second opinion. What did the doctor say there? The oncologist, was it a lung cancer specialist, by the way, um, who was saying this? So we'll go back a little bit at, while I was being hospitalized and, and um, to my unbeknownst to my, you know, um, knowledge, which was the biomarker testing and all that had already been done. They shipped it off. So shipped it off. They took my specimen from the VAT surgery 
and sent it because it's a local hospital in a rural area. So they took my specimen, shipped it off, sent it off to the nearest university, which was about two and a half hours away. And when they received it, they ran all of the, you know, they ran all the tests on it and sent the report back to the hospitalist. The hospitalist knew to do that in the first place because he was from the University of Michigan. So now University of Michigan had already, they were the ones who done the biomarker testing. The hospitalist, you know, uh, you know, Gabe called in the local oncologist and say, okay, this is a cancer patient causing your court. But that local hospital did not have access to the, or I don't even know if they knew how to read all of the report. All I knew is, okay, lung cancer, you stand in this line. I'm speaking more intelligently now is because I'm speaking in hindsight. But then it's like, oh, I don't know. I said, well, you know what? Let me just go to University of Michigan and find out. And so, yeah, I had some options. And the, one of the options was through a targeted chemotherapy. The local oncologist knew nothing about it. The local doctors that I had knew nothing about it. It wasn't even in their database. Now that's a whole horse of a different color. And if I had enough time to spend the rest of my life advocating a thing, and that would be why doesn't the local rule, that's where most folks who are, you know, living just above poverty, <laughs> you know, I was a teacher, teacher salary, you know, we have to go to those kind of doctors and clinics. It's in our area. Why? Are they not knowledgeable of the different biomarkers? So don't talk about me being inclusive or not inclusive. Da, 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 da. Why are they not familiar with these different kinds of lung cancer? It's, it's incredible, right? Because it shifted your entire trajectory. And yes. And, and I love that you brought that up. It's an important point for me too, is understanding and why we do this at the patient's story. We are trying to reach people who don't have access to the big research academic centers who already have right. people who are both in clinic and in research and know about all these things and know all the latest developments. And so this information does need to get out to the millions of people in this country who go to rural, you know, community cancer care centers. And, you know, and I also do understand that a lot of these generalists, there are a lot of general oncologists and they do their best and they're trying to keep up. Um, what I will say is that's why there are these partnerships, right? You can go to your local oncologist, but if you know to say, hey, I'd like for you to work with so-and-so who's at University of Michigan or UCSF or Mayo yes. Clinic, whatever, right? You can have that partnership. And I think an important yes. point here too is the right doctor is okay with that, right? There's no ego there. There's, yes, I have my strengths right. and I need you as a specialist. Exactly. Work together as a team. Well, I don't know why we're territorial. I don't know, where did that come from? Because it doesn't help a patient like me. It doesn't help us. We need you to collaborate and work together. I need the site, the palliative care, doctors, PCPs, whatever you want to call them. Y'all have a meeting every once in a while. My goodness. Right, right, just, right. It's, to me, it's just simple. How about in the, my, I'll just keep it personal because we're talking about the patient's story. I would love, here's a dream world, everyone, whoever I'm speaking to, here's Sharice's dream. And it might happen after I'm called home to glory. But I would sure love to see the day where a patient's file and you, and you, they're the ones who require me to have a PCP, a personal care physician, you know, them, the oncologist, the neurologist, the neurosurgeon, the radiologist, everybody just have a meeting every once in a while. I don't know. Maybe every year, once a year, every six months. I don't know. I know you are busy and we thank you for all that you do, but please consider coming together just to have 
um, a patient review with everyone that's involved. That'd be great. Thank you for your time. I think we can do this. So, we can do this. <laughs> um, with the biomarker testing, it turned out that you were ALK positive, right? So for people who yes. are, are not familiar, and we will, you know, link to a lot of different things about biomarker testing, but and it's also known as genomic testing or mutation testing, but you're trying to figure out, is there, um, you know, a driver mutation? And that's targetable. And that's what you were saying about targeted therapy, right? Yes. So the out positive for you, that was the, the targetable mutation. Can you tell us about what happened right after you learned, oh, okay, I'm out positive. Like I had no idea. How did your oncologist then say, well, here's how things change. He just said, here are some options. And I'll say, I'll take door number three. And so when, <laughs> when I picked it, which is the targeted uh, chemotherapy, he said, well, I have to run this by your insurance. I'm like, oh, insurance? What they got to what? That's all. Now there's another topic. So they ran it by the insurance, went through that process, waited for hours just to see if I can go and get the targeted therapy. You just can't go into, and I'm so glad that University of Michigan had their pharmacy right there. And now we're talking about special deliveries. We're, we're talking, oh, because I'm thinking you can't just send this prescription to Walgreens so I can go pick it up. No, honey, no. You have to, we're going to have to see if the insurance approve it. And if they don't approve it, that would, that, would, that would be a shock to me. Like, what if they didn't approve it? I'm glad they did. But what if they didn't approve it? It's like, for me, now what? That door number three is not available to me. Mm, that's a whole nother conversation. Let's stick to the, that it was approved. So I had to wait and go get it. And then for them to fill it. And it's through their pharmacy only. I would have never been able to get it anywhere else anyway.